this video, I want to look at the history of multi-faith interaction in Australia and how it's developed and changed. And to go right back, actually, to Aboriginal spiritualities, um, which were somewhat varied across Australia and how they clashed with European spiritualities. But even before that, there was the interaction between Aboriginal spiritualities and Islam in the pre-European phase. And that was when the Muslim Macassans from what is now Indonesia would come across since about the 1600s. Um, and they were seeking after sea cucumber and they would process it in Arnhem Land or uh, at, on the Kimberleys uh, when, they, when they came. And we know from the stories of the Aborigines themselves in those particular areas, those stories describe the prayer rituals of the um, Muslims. And so what that means is that Islam was practiced in Australia before Christianity. But with the coming of the Europeans and their invasion of the lands of the Aborigines country, as they say, um, this was a complete failure in terms of interfaith interaction that was productive uh, and harmonious because the European colonial mentality simply did not understand or even want to listen to what the Aborigines um, felt and understood. And these spiritualities go back thousands and thousands of years. And Senator Pat Dodson at the recent UN Interfaith Address, he made the point that the Aboriginal spiritualities were contained in oral traditions that existed well before the Old Testament and New Testament. They predate them by th uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, tens of thousands of years. So we need to remember that. But with their civilizing and missionizing um, agenda, there was no way that the European colonials, not least the Christian missionaries, could sit down and listen. They dismissed Aboriginal thinking, Aboriginal spirituality as paganism and animism and they needed to be converted. So that was a complete disaster. And it's only now, I think in the last 20, 25 years with antecedents before that, that we are really now starting to engage uh, with Aboriginal spiritualities. And the address that Senator Dodson gave several weeks ago highlighted this point. After that, um, that failure, that disaster really, the interfaith relationships in Australia was basically around the contestation between British Protestantism and Irish Catholicism. And that really went on until the 1970s and was heavily mixed up with politics with the main bone of contention being the um, financial aid to private religious schools, particularly Catholic schools. And so the Irish Catholics um, fought their way up in society, basically using the police force the public service and the Labour Party as their conduits to success in Australian society in all aspects.
business, politics, and so on. And uh, that took many decades. And the, during that time, uh, the, the ecumenical movement, the movement for unity between the different Christian groups commenced. You can date that back to the 1860s among the Anglicans, but the date of 1910, um, when there was a big conference in London was where, um, is the historical point that's usually used to mark this, but the Catholics were not part of that. And that really wouldn't happen until the 1960s with Pope St. John the 23rd, who was determined to throw open the windows and open Catholicism to winds of change. Um, but if we go back into the history of interfaith, then that date is 1893, when for the first time in world history in Chicago, that religious leaders from East and West ever had ever met in formal dialogue. And the key person in that was Swami Vivekananda from India, who really was the spiritual arm of Gandhi's political movement that led eventually to the throwing off of the British Raj and India becoming independent. They were intending to have um, the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions every few years, but it never happened. And the next one was held a hundred years later in 1993. And uh, that was uh, a major event. And since then, every four or five years, there is the next parliament of the world's religions. And we had that here in Melbourne uh, in December, uh, 2009. But not to jump too far ahead of ourselves, there was really no interfaith activity in Australia until the 1970s. However, during World War II, there was contact between um, Christian and Jewish leaders, religious leaders, starting in 1941. And that was obviously driven by what was happening in Europe with the Holocaust and all that. And the key people in that process were Archbishop Mole, the Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, and also from Sydney, Rabbi Purush. And that's continued ever since. Uh, in 1991, the Australian Council of Christians and Jews was formed, and there have been since then in this area, um, Jews, Christians and Muslims have now come into the process, livings, where they use the technique of what's called scriptural reasoning, and they, the three faith uh, members from the three communities study each other's scriptures on a particular theme or themes and in that way uh, reach a greater understanding of each other and even their own texts. However, in 1970, the World Council of Religions for Peace came into existence. And it came basically from America, um, but it was very much linked into various Japanese leaders. And they were driven by what had happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they wanted to get religious leaders to take the lead in nuclear disarmament as well as other issues such as development and poverty, 
human rights and religious freedom. Um, Dr. Later Professor Max Charlesworth was the leader, the Australian leader who represented Australia at the 1970 uh, World Assembly, the first ever held in Kyoto in Japan. And then in 1989, uh, the World Assembly was held here in Australia at Monash University, when about 600 people um, came for that assembly of the World Conference on Religions for Peace. And that led in particular to an, the establishment of the first local government multi-faith network in the greater Dandenong region and that still continues. And that's been used as a model for other local government areas. And it's been much stronger even today in Victoria than in other states and territories, even though now um, Religions for Peace Australia has member affiliates in New South Wales, Queensland, uh, Tasmania, South Australia, um, and also in Canberra. And we have representatives from Perth and Darwin. So it's an Australia wide organization. The, so from the 1970s up until the early 2000s, um, interfaith activity um, started and was going fairly strong. And then everything was transformed by 9-11, particularly the two terrorist attacks in Bali when 93 uh, Australians were killed in those terrorist attacks. And that's when I think Australians, much more than the 9-11 attacks in New York, uh, Australians start to realize that we are in new territory where we are being challenged in a different way. And so the government stepped in and it commissioned a report that Gary Balmer, Professor Gary Balmer from Monash, our leading religious sociologist and also an Anglican priest. And I, um, after gathering data from across Australia, wrote a book called Religion, Cultural Diversity and Safeguarding Australia. And another little booklet, which was a how to do book on um, how to form local government networks. And so governments became more focused and that led to the winning of the uh, tender from Chicago to uh, mount the uh, 2009 World Assembly of the Parliament of the World's Religions. And there were about six and a half thousand participants. And it was the first major event to be held at the new um, Melbourne Convention Center. But I think in conclusion that the impetus that was generated since 9-11, particularly by the parliament um, is now tapering off. Um, and now I think we may see another um, resuscitation, if that's the right word, of um, the multi-faith movement, because as I move around the community and talk to political and key community leaders, particularly in the multicultural area, they realize that during COVID-19, 
um, religious leaders with their communities have played an important role, firstly, in alerting the government to particular issues. Religions for Peace Australia, for example, we liaise with both um, federal and state governments about the plight of um, international students and of temporary visa um, stayers in Australia, some of whom were starving um, in, by about May, June, because they didn't have any income because their usual income may be from family and sometimes that dried out as well because of the situation of the family back in the home country had dried up. Um, and the temporary visa, they didn't have those jobs in restaurants and cafes and all that sort of um, piecework. Uh, they didn't have that income. So they were in desperate situation. And also in um, changing attitudes, yesterday I was being told how a, an imam was addressing his community here in Melbourne about six weeks ago. And he was asked, um, would he allow his mother uh, to be given the vaccine? And he said, he responded in the positive, in the best positive way, saying that all Muslims must take the, um, the vaccine because it's for the common good. It's to protect not only ourselves, but other people. So that is going, I think, interesting to watch because as I look at the multi-faith scenario in Australia, we need to set up an interfaith council of Australia, as many other countries have. The ones I know best are South Korea, Singapore, and Kenya. But even the UK ha has, has such a body. And then um, the US presidency, its office, has the office of faith-based and neighborhood um, um, partnerships, and that plays a key role. And um, President Biden has recently appointed another person to give him advice on um, the whole religious profile and their leaders in um, helping him to um, govern the United States. So the multi-faith history of Australia has always been interesting. It's getting more complex, particularly now that um, the Buddhist and Hindu communities, together with the Muslim communities, um, are so large, six, seven percent um, for those three communities, if not a bit more. Um, so we do need to address more formally and a more organized way to bring much more cohesion because it is part of um, social cohesion agenda and a policy to include interreligious harmony and communication channels uh, between, not only between the different religious groups and other community organizations, but governments and their departments. So thank you very much. And I hope that um, this talk has enabled you to understand in a deeper way, the multi-faith history of Australia. Thank you.